my name is Makia and um, Sebastian and I have this started this uh, steel guitar hangout. I'm glad you guys could all join. Um, today, obviously, we've got Bobby and Gano on the on the call. We're really thankful for him and uh, for offering his time to, to share insights about about the instrument, about the music. Um, we are going to try to we are going to record this call so that folks who can't attend can get to watch it later. Um, and um, another bit of housekeeping, we've I'm not sure how many people are going to come on. We want to just have this pretty loose. You know, you can every, anybody can ask questions, kind of a free flowing conversation. But um, it may make sense just to start if you have questions to add them to the chat bar. Um, just so that we, you know, can keep the crosstalk down. And um, so, if you want to just post your questions there, write anything. And um, Joe is with uh, with Bobby, and so he can kind of field questions. And um, yeah. we're also going to have um, uh, Joe is going to post his Venmo account and PayPal. And so, if you'd like to contribute. Um, anything to the fund. This is, these are all tips that are going to go to Bobby for his time. So we'll have that in the chat bar. Um, so you can see that there. And um, I guess that's about it. We'll go ahead and start and I'll turn things over to, um, to Joe and Bobby. Bobby can say hello and, and get started. Um, and uh, if you have any question, you know, if, feel free, if, if you have any technical issues, you can make, put a question to the chat too. All right. Well, Bobby, thank you for um, for joining us. I'll turn things over to you. Okay. Anything you guys want to ask? Recipes? Anything? <laughs> oh yeah, we had well, we had one. I should start with the first question. I think it was uh, Christo had asked, "What's the best sushi place in Fort Collins?" Oh, it's it's um, what's this place we went? It's like a couple blocks away from Fort Collins. I mean that hotel where we played and we ate there and it was just as good as eating in Hawaii or Japan. So we asked the waiters, you know, when you guys learn this and we all went to school, we all went to school in Japan. I, I forgot the name of the place, the sushi place. Yeah, it's like a couple blocks away from the hotel where they held a, a concert. I mean, really, Real Japanese sushi. Well, I know we had um, we had asked the group before yeah. if anybody has questions, and, and one question that Andy Volk had asked is um, the secret to your chimes. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love when people think they're secrets, and they, you know, um, well, my mentor Feet said. There's no such thing of secrets. It just takes practice. And the thing is, when you're doing the chimes, you have to turn this off. <laughs> don't, don't think. He said, you, you have to go by feel and, and trust that you'll hit it. Because whenever I start something like a chicken, this means I'm thinking. You, you just turn this off and everything is by, you know, Everything is just just go by feel and, and trusting in yourself. But it also takes hours of practice. Uh, I mean, the chiming, well, it's like Eric Clapton said, when, when you bend the blues notes, just that bending takes years. It's the same thing like chiming. And the, the chiming is like, um, it's funny, the lighter, you, you brush the chimes, the more it blossoms. If you attack, it's gonna sound like a thumping sound. So always um, you just brush and your chimes will come on really clear. But easier said than done. <laughs> you know, I hardly practice nowadays, you know. I'm mainly in the, in the kitchen. <laughs> but that's it, a lot of practice. I mean, you know, a lot of people think it's magic. No, no, <laughs> you know, and I started practicing on this lockdown. When, when the lockdown started, I thought, all oh, right, a break. And I didn't play steel for about like three weeks. 
Now I got the steel right next to my recliner. You know, you have to practice every day, whether it's 15 minutes or like three hours, because one thing with steel guitar, you can you can lose it so fast. Faster than, you know, if you stop playing guitar, you can jump back on, you know. But the steel is a different story. So if I'm not practicing, I'm eating. <laughs> you can see. Any, um, any other questions? I have a question, uh, Bobby. You you are raised in Lanai, right? Yeah, like the first seven years of my life was in Lanai. And do you have memories? How, how was it? Because it's really remote in a way, right? It's uh, not a lot of people live yeah. there. It, it was like you didn't have to lock your doors. Everybody on the island knew each other. It was, um, yeah, it is. I, I wish people could go back to them, those times, you know. When, like whenever one family didn't have enough food, the neighbor would invite them over. You know, it was like, Well, it's like um, when, when I go to Midwest, you know, my good brother and sister, Bob Smith and Barb Woods always takes care of me. And the first time I went to the Midwest, I told them, man, it's like I'm back in Lanai, Lanai City. You know, I mean, uh, uh, people got to bring that back, you know? And, and I guess that's why the music was much happier back then more feel, people didn't worry about fame and fortune. It was just playing to make people happy. And I still remember Lanai, in fact, I mean, I still wish, still wish I could go back to those, those days, you know. We, we, had, we had the skeleton key, you know, <laughs> with a keyhole like that, but we never had to lock our doors. Yeah, it was like a pineapple plantation. But since they got rid of the pineapple now, oh, you got a lot of crime happening there now. Because you have a lot of people moving to the island, you know. But ah, I guess they call it progress. Eh? So anything, anything you guys want to ask? The rest of the group seems to be a little bit shy. Come on, people. <laughs> I think there are a lot of questions. Hey, Chris. Hey, Bobby. <laughs> great to see you. Hey, Man, hey brother. How are you? Great. Really great. It's great to see you. I have to put on uh, this, cap, this cap because my hair looks like it's weird. Um, so I thought maybe you could tell everybody, didn't you, uh, didn't you find your, uh, seven string Rickenbacker, like with no pickup in it in a junk shop or something? Maybe you can tell oh, people about your instrument. Oh, no, no, actually the first seven string cry pen, I got it like on a trade for a triple neck Rickenbacker. You know, those, those big triple H strings. The reason why I put that is because somebody was selling it for like $500, which is a steal. Uh -huh. I played it just a couple of times and it was just too much, you know, triple H strings. So this guy wanted it and he told me he had a seven string, but had no parts, just the body. So I said, well, let's make a trade. He thought I was nuts, but I mean, I had a seven string bake light, like a post where I just picked up from a shop. So I just got the guts from that. And, but that seven string fry pan, I found out later belonged to um, Tommy Castro. It uh, was given by his family to Eddie Palama, who, who just mm -hmm. passed away, still playing Hawaii. But that's my main ex. <laughs> Yeah. It's like a short, a short post-war solid neck, yeah, with the open back. Because a seven string, you know, I always played six string, and 
I remember buying this record album by Lino Manchado where uh, Billy Hulan is a steel player. And when we try to copy, you know, I, I could copy all the rest of the albums. When I tried to copy him, I found it impossible. And I found out from this old timer that he's playing an A6. So I thought if I'm going to switch to A6, I have to learn all my songs all over again. So when I listen to the A6, you know, some of the strings was like a low version to a C6. So I put on a high G and got the seven string and that's been my main tuning since. Yeah, I mean, uh, I didn't want to learn every song all over again. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it was it was uh, on a trade, and I, I never missed the triple mic. You know? <laughs> and I didn't have a little hand truck to wheel it around. You know, you know how big the thing is. Uh. <clears throat> hey, Bobby, I had a question about A6. I know that uh, obviously Billy Hulan was famous for using A6. Yeah. Are there a lot of other um, Hawaiian players who use that? It seems like it seems like most is the C13 or C6. Yeah, Billy was um, one of the only ones. But then again, um, there was a lot of unknowns. Like um, the, the way I found out that about the A6 was uh, I was playing in this group in 1981 in Kaneohe. And we was playing all Sons of Hawaii stuff. And um, his dad, the guitar player's dad, you know, he wanted my frying pan. So I said, no, oh, man. He said, yeah, you know, I never owned one. I said, oh, sorry. <laughs> you know, so he brought out his Fender Stringmaster, single neck. And he said, yeah, you can try my Fender. Maybe you would like to trade. I said, no. <laughs> you know, he was trying, trying. Then I played. A tuning, I said, What tuning is this? And then he told me, That's Billy Hulens tuning A6. And right, right, from right there, I, you know. The, to me, the C6 with the high G, I mean, you can, you know, and just adding that that high string, you know, I thought it was going to be like a cakewalk. It took me three years to get used to, to that extra high G, you know, because, um, the, the advantage with that is you don't have to cry my voice to the top. You can just, you know, go to the high G, you know, right before the E. And um, funny thing is, uh, ben, Benny Kalama once told me, I got invited to Halikulani yeah, to, to see the Alan used to invite me to Halikulani. And I was tuning up my steel and then Benny Kalama told me, Hey, that's a C6 with a high G. He said, people stopped using that in the early 50s and they went back to C6. But to me, that's the sweetest. Well, for me, it's the, um, um, I, I, I don't like to change tunings, you know. The only time I change tuning on a, on a seven string is when I'm playing sleepwalk. So I tune the low to a C. Other than that, other than that, it's always a B flat, so I can make a seven chord. <laughs> so what I had to do was all these songs like played on B eleven. I just switched the chords and played on the C six with the high G. You know, but you have to do a lot of slants, but you know, it's easier than retuning. <laughs> yeah, I tell you that. But sometimes you retune the string breaks, and if you don't have the extra string. Shows over. <laughs> in the... uh, any questions? Anything? Alan. <laughs> oh, it's brother what's Bobby. Up? What's up? It was fun yesterday, man. Yeah. Oh yeah, that was but good. I was really, we was re really waiting for you to do the hula or something, man, because yeah. we didn't do the hula. <laughs> I didn't have enough kickaboo, uh, kickapoo juice in me. You must be so full of ice cream with all your posts. Yeah. Well, 
Look at Jen Uberry. What is that? Uh, that 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 bottle of refreshment. Oh, huh. oh, wow. that looks awfully good to me. Anyway. I, just wish, I just wish they would bring back apple beer. <laughs> apple beer. You never heard of that? In the seventh, no. it no, was I'm like not aware a, of apple beer. Yeah, it was like a carbonated drink that was the same color. Oh, as beer. oh, 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 okay. Non-alcoholic, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> oh. All I remember is having butter beer when I went to see uh, when I went to um, uh, Universal Studios. Apple beer. Anyway. Oh, aloha, everybody. Nice to see you. Mikia, thank you for, for sending the, um, the, the, the invite. Uh, sorry, I, I just wanted to come and check it out for a little while before I go into my next class um, and, and, and so on. But uh, nice to see all of you folks out there. Um, good to see you. Yeah, good to see you, Alan. All the way from Germany, Sebastian. All right. Yeah. And Jim, I'll see you on Wednesday, yeah? Oh, okay, cool. Hey, Alan, I got to tell you that student that um, plays with Patrick. Yeah. That, that guy is so good. Man. Justin from Meza. He, he's 80 great. years old. Yeah, he's going to be he's quite great. a player. <laughs> and he's only been taking for what, three, not even four months. And uh, he's brand new to the steel guitar, but you can see the talent oh. he has. Yeah, I, I mean, you really tell, good, like, yeah. You can tell he finds a lot of stuff on his own, yeah? You know, yeah, he, well, you know, he plays piano, he likes jazz, and so you can hear that in his style. I mean, he's he's experimenting on the steel guitar, and he's finding chords, you know, um, and he's using the high G tuning like you, um, ex except he has, um, he has an H string, and that steel guitar that you saw him playing, that was donated by uh, one of my students in Florida. It's a uh, uh, Herb Remington steel guitar, and it sounds great. Yeah, yeah. And, and and he's loving it. Yeah, he's so so. Um, if any if any of you tune into our um, high melee uh, steel guitar showcase, um, I know some of you did because you know I saw your names down there, um, but but. Uh, you know, when we feature the next gen, you know, some of those kids are doing extremely well. And plus, you know, there's the new, uh, a new one, Mandy, yeah? She's yeah. Uh, in the seventh grade. Um, she's coming along. The steel guitar she has was donated by by um, uh, um, Chuck Moore. Oh, yeah, 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 I know. Yeah, yeah, so, um, but thanks, thanks, you know, like, like Bobby, yeah, you know, he's a role model for for the kids, you know, they, they just love their Uncle Bobby. And, 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 you know, I can tell because I noticed when they do a jam like on Hen Hen and Kuaka, they're playing a few notes in there that sounds like Uncle Bobby's. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I fish him in with uh, um, almond M&Ms. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and they want to learn Uncle Bobby's song, right? Right, Bobby? That's so funny. Yeah. You know, you know, well, we're referring to, to a Sleepwalk, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, some of the kids call it Uncle Bobby's song. <laughs> so it has a new name, a new title. Yeah. We, but, should, call, we should call it Flipwalk. No, no. Flipwalk. No. Oh, well, hello there. <laughs> Uh, boy. Nah, but everybody, you know, Bo Bobby is, is sound is, guy is really good. Man. Oh yeah, yeah, that's Holy. good. But Bobby, Bobby is, uh, he he does inspire many many people with his his touch and his tone. I mean, like no other. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, you know. Oh, Joseph is over there too. Yeah, he said this thing. Up. How's, How's it, Joseph? Yeah. How's your still guitar? It's coming along. Jeff set up the Fender 1000 last night, so we're playing a little pedal last night. A uh, pedal? Oh, man. Okay. Oh. You know what Jerry Bird would say, huh? I have Cut those cables. Cut those cables. Yeah. <laughs> Me and Jeff were trying yeah. to get up last yeah. night. Yeah. yeah. Oh, gosh. You don't need no damn pedals. You know, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, you don't need no damn pedals. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I know. But... 
But Bobby, Bobby does does inspire many, including myself. Yeah. So. Hey, it, you know, it works both ways because I remember in the 70s or the 80s, I think it was the 70s, in one day I seen I saw um Casey on Super Kids, right? And Greg on uh um, Danny Kalikini show, and I, sh I saw you with your long shoulder length hair on Olelo. And, you know, the inspiration started with you three, too. You know, yeah. my, bro my brother Ralph would be saying, hey, Bobby, this guy's younger than you. You better you better get going. <laughs> well, so well, you we always inspire each other. Man. Yeah, you, you're, do you're doing good. Love listening to you every time. Love. Thank you. Likewise. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Bobby, uh, what's the what's the story on uh, on Feats B six that you have? Feats what? Feats Rickenbacker B six. Oh. Um. Somebody had stolen his. You see, they was recording for the Danny Kalikini show in 1977, and um, when they went on a break, they went out to eat lunch. And he came back and he was gone. You know, he said it was an inside job. Somebody stole it. So, and that was from his dad. You know, that was his uh, only only big light. It was like a post war. So I heard about it and uh, I was really heavy into listening to Sons of Hawaii and Pete Rogers. So I went to his house and I had just bought a brand new, I mean, um, like a mint condition B6, you know, post, post war, same model. So I gave it to him. And like four months ago, it made its way back to me. I mean, it's it's so beat up, but I, I, you know, that's the mojo, you know, in Hawaii we call it the mana. You know, people told me to restore and I said, you crazy. You know, because from when, when Pete passed away, it went to his dad. So his dad put some stickers on the headstock, Pops, Rogers. So after he passed away, it went to Pete's uh, student, Fred Fred Lunt on Kauai. So he passed away, the family gave it um, back to the family, to uh, Pete's nephew. And Pete's nephew, he, he cannot play post-war, so he called me up, he wanted a pre-war. So I said, oh, I got one. He said, yeah, I'm going to bring back the guitar you gave Pete, and I, I was speechless. Man. So I got it back, and it sounds just as good as when I gave it to him. And on that one, I just use, I, I leave it to the D tuning, you know, his, his tuning. But I never thought I was able to go and see that thing again. You know, so that that that's for that for that we we just I just do sounds of Hawaii music on there. Because if I do it, yeah. You miss playing with other people? Are you able to play with the others during the pandemic? No, hardly, hardly play. Um just Alan's uh live stream and all our gigs in Hawaii, everything got shut down. So, uh -huh. so with my thrill, thrill, um, we, we just had like two gigs. And I miss playing with you guys, man. <laughs> no, really, man. It's been such a long time, you know? Yeah. And I remember, <laughs> he, he just like he could see the future. He said, you know, Bobby, we, 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 we got to grab you for as much gigs as you, we can, because one day you're going to be so famous, you won't be able to play with anybody. I said, no, no, no. But I guess he, he must have known, because, but, but thanks for coming to that, that concert, man, in, uh, what's that place now? Where is he? I forgot the name of that. Lynchburg. Place. Yeah, Virginia. Lynchburg, Virginia. Yeah. That was yeah. Great. What a night. I, I, we had such you know, a time. Yeah, I, I miss I miss all that, you know, Dayton, Ohio City Folk Fest. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, 
Yeah. You know, yeah, I'm traveling with Dodge and I'm really you, you, you mean with that guy who does that lasso trick? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know That's me. Right, right? Hey. The lasso, you're right. Number one. Number one, brother. Yeah. The you way know, you do that lasso oh, yeah. at, at the HSG conventions. I came over to the house one time and Barb brought her violin and she started playing and my family just got so hooked and, and Doug and his rope tricks, you know. <laughs> they, they never saw anything like that Very before. I ran her fiddle, huh? Fiddling around. Oh, man. Yeah, I, I, I miss playing all over the place. Yeah, man. Yeah. But you know, the, the good thing is at least um, with technology nowadays, we still can see each other and talk, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a, it's really it's really a blessing. And then, you know, I always tell people, um, they say, why don't you get a laptop? You know, I had one, but to me, even a cell phone is harder to operate than playing a steel. <laughs> Come on, Bobby, nah, sit with it. No, it. It's driving me, it's driving me crazy, man. <laughs> you know, I never wanted a cell phone. I never wanted a cell phone. It's my younger sister that said, the phone is ringing off the damn wall. All your fans calling you. You're gonna, I'm gonna get you a cell phone whether you like it or not. No. That's Bob. Any, anyway, hey. Hey, hey, Bobby, nice to see you again. Thank you for hey. uh, joining yesterday. Hey, the, the entire performance was fantastic. Um, oh, by the way, everybody, uh, Bobby's going to be featured next month at the end of January. Yeah, the last Saturday of January at the next uh, showcase. And uh, it'll be uh, Bobby and, and Greg Sardina. Yeah. But you should join in February, us. February, it's going to be the two boys, Capona Lopes and Jeff Ahoy. <laughs> so you should join, Ellen, you should join me and Greg on ukulele or something, man. Like Who? you said, you. But <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm too busy drinking Kickapoo juice. <laughs> no, eating ice cream. Come on. <laughs> Somebody has to make snide comments from the audience, right? With my <laughs> microphone. Yeah. Anyway, I, I, I got to go. Sorry, everybody. Um, Nice to see all of you. Steve, nice to see you too. <laughs> all of you guys. Nick, all of you guys. Bill. Um, Aloha, everybody. Uh, Mikia, Sebastian continue to do this. Uh, th this is wonderful. You know, a little forum on steel guitar. Christo, I'll see you on, on the videos for the HSG um, virtual concert or, or convention. So anyway, um, anyway, everybody, Melikalikimaka, take care. I got to go to my next class, my steel guitar class. Ahui ho. Aloha. Hello. Take care. All right, so Nick had a question. Um, said, Bobby, can you talk about your approach to chord solos? Uh, I, actually, chord solos was learned. I, I learned a lot listening to Barney Isaacs and uh, uh, Jules Assi. You know, and the way I would find the chords would, was um, just like like the old time it used to tell me everything you need to know is right on the fretboard you just gotta find it <laughs> i mean it, it, you know, it's like a common sense thing so i would i would just play a chord if it doesn't and i would put the bar straight and hit certain strings to find that chord if it doesn't sound right i'll move the bar to another place because everything i do is by ear yeah and um and and when when Alan plays or like Casey plays, I always watch the bar movement because um, that's how I found a lot of chords. And to me, the chords is you know just eliminate the the notes that doesn't fit or doesn't sound right. And it's like a common sense thing when you think about it, yeah. Because um, you know J Jerry Jerry wanted to take me under his wing to, to teach me how to read. But you know, I never was good in school, so I, I turned him down and <laughs> he got kind of angry, but 
yeah, we fixed that up, you know. We made peace. <laughs> you know, just, and slanting, I would just slant and hit different strings. That's how I really find my chords. And when a singer is singing, if you want to play a chords, you got to be real quiet. And if you're playing like harmonics or chimes, um, you weave in between the singers without stepping on their vocals. Yeah, because I learned that from getting scoldings from this big Hawaiian lady. I think she was about 300 pounds. <laughs> she came up and sat in with us and she was singing and I was just banging away on the steel. And she just stopped playing and turned around and said, is this the Bobby Ngano show? <laughs> she, said, <laughs> she said, cool it. And so, you know, you learn from a lot of scoldings, yeah. But the main thing is not to step on, on the singers. And I guess the chord is like, when you play a chord and the guy is singing, it's like the person sings, you answer with the chord. And right after, when he's going out of his verse, you answer with the chord. And when I started doing that, you know, then uh, the scoldings got less and less. <laughs> well, Nick, I know you had a follow-up question. Do you want to just ask it? Maybe easier than have me read it. Uh, so, yeah, so Bobby, I have a follow-up question on that, on your record uh, where you play After You've Gone, that your chord solo sounds like a, you know, like real, like a big band shout chorus kind of chord solo like um were you consciously checking out jazz and trying to copy it or did that just well well that's from listening to a lot of barney isaacs okay yeah because barney isaacs um well I, I listen to a lot of big band stuff too and um but it, it actually came from barney you know because he he would always play cards you know and Is he playing c6 yeah yeah, on the eight string, yeah. And I guess they call it C13. Or something. Okay. Yeah. And the, actually, the best way I found out to to learn, like, swing chords on a steel, just listen to the old stuff in the Alfredo Pacas group. A lot of the steel players had a big sound. And they would, you know, they would play all these chords that would sound like a brass section. Yeah. And yeah, I just I just try to just try to match them, <laughs> and hoping that people will like it, you know. Because I, I don't know what I'm doing to tell the truth, but if it sounds okay, uh, it must be good. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Thank you. Man. Well, I'll ask another question. But please, everybody, if you got questions, just just uh, we don't have to use the chat. We can. This is a small enough group, so just chime in and ask. But um, Bobby, I remember something. I think you said this. Um, I think this is when I first heard you or met you. You said, "Practice steel guitar, like listen to records and study everything to a T for three years before you play publicly or something." It was like just dig into the recordings for a long time. Well, yes. Um, well, I did. <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering it, with um, kind of in your development, you taking that three years of really careful study. After that point, do you still check out a lot of steel players, or do you just do your own thing and not think about kind of what's come before you, or what, what's your approach? You know, well, since after those three years. No, well, actually, after those three years, you know, it's like every day, you know, and was like, you know, I was, I was working full time. So before I left to work, to go work, I would practice 15 minutes. And then I would actually bring a small amp and my steel to my work. Mm -hmm. So on the lunch, we have a lunch hour, I would stuff the food in my face like five minutes and practice for 55 minutes. I mean, it's just that I wanted uh, that's how bad I wanted to be a steel player. But whenever I'm playing, you know, I always think you know, of who came before me, you know, because um, without 
the people before me, I would have been doing this today. You know, um, when people tell me it's about you now, I say, look, you know, music is never about you. It's about the audience. You know, you there for the audience, not for yourself. Yeah, I mean, if you know, they always tell me if the audience don't get it, it's your fault. Don't blame the audience. So I take all that, all, all this advice here, yeah, and I'm always thinking of the old timers whenever I sit down and play, because I know they watch it, <laughs> watching and listening. And it wasn't until I heard like uh, Jeff Ahoy, then I started to pay attention. Man, there's all these young guys. I mean, this Joe right here, this is another one. I mean, now I started to listen to all the young ones because there's a there's a whole bunch, a whole a whole generation of young steel players that are picking up the steel. And the thing is um, about that is uh, every generation. I mean, there was male and female players, yeah, but there was so little bit female players, you know. This generation coming up, um, I think the girls is gonna outnumber the guys. <laughs> so I think Auntie Alice is really happy about that because Auntie Alice is a slack new player, but I heard she played steel before um, slack new. Even when you play, you always have to think about where it came from. I, I think you cannot break that connection. You know, you, you have to hold on to. I guess your roots, yeah. But also at the same time, um, uh, I get really happy when the young ones started to be inspired by my playing. You know? So it's it's like a continuation, you know. You know, you gotta honor what came before you. Yeah, um, not actually think about it, but if you're gonna think, then I, I always think of the ones that came before me. And when you do, you know, like I said, it's, music is more about feel. Because there's some days that when I, I pick up the steel and I start playing and it sounds like crap. <laughs> well, to me, you know. And a lot of the old timers said, if that happens, put it in a way. Don't force yourself to play, you know. Yeah, you, you know, you have your on and off nights. I got another question, Bobby, about practicing. Um, you know, when you're spending that much time practicing, and you're talking about a real focused amount of time. Yeah. Are you spending time working on music rudiments on your instrument, or are you like just learning tunes and playing along with records? Yeah. Well, how do you spend your time when you're doing that much practice? Well, um, all that time Are you practicing I, scales and things like that, or is it just no, no, no. I, I, I never practice scales. The way I practice is if I'm really into a, this album, like an album with Gino Calvi and Benny Rogers playing the steel, I work on that album until I get every song the closest I can. Then I move on to my next favorite album. You know, I mean, it's more like you have to, you have to um, copy to learn. I mean, when you're learning, you know, that's what the old timers tell me, you know, you, you, you not, nothing wrong with copying. You copy all your favorite steel players, your albums. But after you've done that, then you throw it into your pot, <laughs> in your, your big pot of stew, and you add your ingredient to that. Yeah. So that's how I always learn because I never could afford music lessons. Yeah? You know, so, um, every luau that I used to go to, if I would hear a steel player, I would sit right next to the stage and watch whatever they're doing. You know, lessons is free. You know, Feet Rogers once said that lessons is free. And the old style of learning is uh, don't, don't pay a fee, you pay attention. <laughs> Hope, you used to tell me, open your ears, Open your eyes and shut that mouth. <laughs> and you know, yeah. 
I mean, that way you can take it at your own pace. You know, there's some kids who wanted to learn and they would ask me, uh, uh, how much time do you spend on practicing? And then when I told them, they get scared. They said, wow, then when am I gonna get famous? I said, ah, this not for you then. <laughs> you know, you, you cannot be, I guess a lot of people are afraid of um, learning when I tell them how, how hard it is, but hey, nothing's easy, man. And, uh, it, it, everything in life, you gotta work at it if you want it. And then, and then what I tell a lot of kids is never give up. Because if you give up, you stop, all that time is wasted. You know, all the time you spend practicing. And another thing, I would pull my phone off off the wall. <laughs> That's the only way I could practice. And it's a good thing they didn't have cell phones back then. Yeah? So, you know, but then I would hear a lot of rumors like, hey, the, the guy Bobby is a hermit now, he's washed up. <laughs> but, you know, just practice, practice. You know, I tell a lot, a lot of kids like, if you hear a song, you really want to play, you really want to learn, practice it until it sounds the closest you can get to it. Don't go halfway and then jump on stage and make a fool of yourself. You know, I, I did that before, you know, with, with guitar. So, but, and it works now, you know, for me, you know, doesn't, it doesn't matter how long it takes to learn that song. If you want to learn it, there's no other way. You have to learn it so you can, you know, you can do it on stage. And that's why I don't, I never do Whispering Lullaby. <laughs> that's the hardest song on steel guitar in the world. So, and I, I, I don't practice enough to play that song, you know. I leave it to Alan, Akaka, and Alexis Tolentino. So, any more questions? So, Bobby, who are the most, if, uh, the, the steel guitarists that influence you the most? So, like the top five players you listened to a lot? Uh, it's uh, like, well, one, and the, the first one is Steve Rogers and his uncle Benny Rogers. And then you got Billy Hulan, David Kelly. There's so much poor Almeda. Uh, Billy, yeah. I mean, uh, Jules Asi. You know, a lot of them from that golden era of Hawaiian music. Because, uh, you know, a lot of times I wish I was playing, I was playing back in those days, but then I'm thinking I wouldn't have a chance. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't get hired. I mean, the steel players back then was so, um, well, I guess like practice to it. I mean, there was like out of this world. I mean, it's like old, it's like old country players, the old country steel players, you know, walking, Murphy and all that. I mean, you listen to them, you want to just give up already. Yeah. Um, but that's that's like, um, but oh yeah, and Gabby Pahinui, but the reason why Feet is the number one, he was the, the simplest player and his tuning was just a major tuning, a family tuning. No six, no sevens, no nothing, just a major, not even a minor, but his feel was like he could play, you know, old time stuff. When he was like 19 years old, he started playing. He would bring the old timers to tears, you know. And you know, sometimes I try get fancy and fast, but then I stop. I say, no, you know, what's the use? I mean, um, if you ain't got the feel, to me, that's it's not real, man. You know. It's like the old country songs like uh, Lefty Frizzell. I mean, it's so simple, but you listen to him saying he can bring you the tears. You know, you have to have the feel. That, that's the most important thing. Because, you know, David Kelly, he was like 
they call him like the supreme steel player in Hawaii. You know, he was the top, and he was he was in um, he inspired like Jules and everybody, Jerry Bird, and I got to speak to him just a couple of years before he passed away in the eighties. And I asked him, who's your favorite steel player? And his favorite is Pete Rogers because of the feel, you know? But it doesn't mean Pete couldn't get fancy on the steel. But whenever he played just simple, he, he would have goosebumps, you know? So that's the most important thing here. Although, um, you got players who can just fly, you know, I like to watch players who can play fast too. But for me, it's got to be feel, you know, get a better response. Because I tried getting fancy and I would drop the bar. <laughs> if you drop the bar, man, oh, <clears throat> <It's> a, <clears throat> you cannot cover that up, man. Any questions? Any other questions from the group? Ugh. <laughs> don't be shy. Don't be shy. <laughs> well, who are some of the favorite ones that you were able to actually see play live? I mean, did you did you see Billy Hulen play? And was oh, she still I around? And, I, I seen all of them except like Pooh Almeida, Jules Asi, and Gabby. Yeah. You know, and you know, I played years with Martin Pahinui, right? At at right. at the Marriott. And we would, we, would, we would always sit and talk on the breaks. And I told Martin, the biggest regret I have, you know, learning Hawaiian music late is I never got to meet your dad. So he started laughing. I said, what's so funny? He said, it's a good thing you didn't meet my dad. So I said, why? He said, if my dad heard you play, he would lock you up in Waimanalo. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I never had a compliment like that before. And he said, that's right, Bobby. My father would lock you up and never, he would never, let, he wouldn't let you go home. He wouldn't want to jam with you and stuff. But the, the, my first gig I was going to, I remember, was we got a job at, um, with his band in Kaneohe. We got a job playing at Shakey's Pizza Parlor. Kaneohe, yeah. Still the best pizza in, in my opinion. <laughs> but next, next to Barb and Doug's, vegetarian pizza <laughs> but you know we was on our way to the gig and it came on the news gabby had just passed away mm -hmm. i never i wish i i wish i got to see this one guy i really wish i got to see you know play yeah but i saw david Kelly and billy land and Either two things would happen. I wouldn't want to quit or I would get inspired. <laughs> yeah. Because they 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 was like um effortless when, when they did it, yeah. But then again, when uh you know when I would talk to them, it's the same thing. You just gotta practice. You know, don't don't, don't be afraid to when something is really hard, don't be afraid of it. If you really want it, you know, and don't put a time limit on when you're gonna learn it. Because once, once you put a time limit, that's, that's your first mistake, actually. Like, um, people would tell me, man, if I don't get it in one year, I'm going to quit. I say, well, that's your problem. <laughs> because never, never give up, man. Any questions? Do you remember the day where you met uh, Pete Rogers? And you saw him the first time? Oh, um, actually, the first time I saw him was in uh, the 1978 when I heard um, somebody had stolen his bake light, you know, and that's the first time I have uh, met him. I mean, I, I have heard, I've heard his records and everything with the sun, you know? and it's funny thing, when I, when I went to his house, I met him. And I look at him and we actually, we, we grew up in that area around the fish market where I work. 
And then when I looked at him, I said, hey, this is the beat, the beatnik. We used to always call him the beatnik. We didn't know who he was. All we know was we used to play football at this elementary school close to where he was living, I guess, you know. But we would always see this guy walking down the street, bobbing his head with a flat cap. And we would say, hey, there's the beatnik again. And I had no idea that was Feet Rogers. And I would tell him, yeah, well, I remember you. You would always walk and you didn't have a radio, but you would be snapping your fingers. And <laughs> I remember his, his comeback was, why you need radio? No music sounds better than the music in your head. <laughs> you know, he said, you don't need a radio or Walkman. You just, he said, you just listen to the music in your head. And when I first saw him play, it was after I gave him big life. Man, I know. I remember we went to Blue Dolphin Room. And I could swear that night he was playing. He was playing for me because that's the best I ever heard him. And he never played like that after that. You know, he was so happy, you know, he told me where he played. So I went down there with a friend of mine and we walked in the blue dog room and he's playing by the corner and I heard Bobby and I looked at him and he started rapping the steel. But everything he did that night, for some reason, you know, it was 1978. Till today, I still can remember everything he did that night, all his licks. And I don't know how I can still remember. So uh, I guess, you know, people would tell me, yeah, but you, you, you're watching him with the steel like this and you're looking this way. So I said, just follow his fingers. So I just follow his fingers, but I had to find what string he was on. And, you know, people tell me, but that's hard, eh? I said, yeah, no shit, <laughs> of course. <laughs> but uh, I remember after that, at the performance, I ordered a, a, a soda because you know I wanted to be sober listening to this guy for the first time and I swear I was just so stunned at what he was doing first the ice melted in the soda and then the soda actually separated from the water I mean I was that stunned and one of my friends was with me who brought me down there he said man he um you feeling all right or what? And I remember my very words to him was, my exact words was, you know what? If Eric Clapton was here, he would not, he would get knocked out by this guy. And the next day I quit playing guitar for three years. <laughs> and I pursued the steel because what I heard that night was um, like, well, I had heard Gabby like a week ago, uh, ago on, on this, uh, cassette tape that my older brother gave me. You know, my older brother was picking me up from work and he, he said, you gotta listen to this. There's no name on the tape and there's just one song. And he put it on and it was a blue Hawaiian moonlight. And from that from that day on, I was thinking of winning already because I thought, how can something sound this deep you know, and I thought, man, I feel like quitting guitar because I got to find out why this thing is making me feel like this. Never had that feeling before. It's, it's like it, it, it sent you way back to your childhood in happier days. You know, you know that's why um, to me, still, yeah, there's a lot of technical things about steel, but you know what? Without feeling spirit, without being spiritual, you're never gonna get it fully. Get it, you know, because um, it, it's all feel. Yeah, and I, I still can remember that night when, when the first time I saw Pete playing, and he played better that night than all his recordings and anything. After that, that night, you know, and I couldn't afford a camera. You know, you didn't have like 
uh, a camcorder back then, yeah? but I still remember. <laughs> and after that, we would go down to um, Blue Dolphin Room, you know, the weeks after that. He, he, he never played at the level he played the night after I gave him the steel guitar. And uh, yeah, I, I I consider myself really lucky man, to to have witnessed that. You know, I would be there and say, "Oh, that's how you do it." Oh, okay, okay, I got it. <laughs> but I made sure I was sober that night. <laughs> but you know, like everything else, you know, you start getting, you start letting get it, get it to your head, getting it to your head. So after about three years of practicing, you know, my dad would come home and he said, hey, a lot of old time was talking about you. And I, was, and I was like, oh, and my dad looked at me, he said, you remember what I said? <laughs> he said, don't get big headed or you're gonna knock you out. I would knock you out on the stage in front of everybody. So my dad kept me, my feet to him, because I, I really let it get to my head to where a point was like, arrogant, you know, like, you know, people would say, hey, this Filipino kid, he's, he's shouting down all the steel players, and, you know, I would walk around thinking, ooh, but you know what, it's like any art, the older you get, then you're going to find out, hey, I'm not that good, in fact, I'm, I'm not good at all, <laughs> but if you don't get to that point, you know, you cannot grow. To, to grow, you gotta you gotta behave, start behaving again, you know. And and now with all the the talent coming out now, and I mean especially Jeff, oh boy, man, that kid is like the best. Because um, I remember in 2014 they invited me to go to Fort Collins, so I had a big gig in Japan. And I couldn't go, you know, scheduled already. So I remember the guy asking me, you got anybody in mind? So I said, Jeff, oh boy. Then the guy told me, I never heard, we never heard of the guy. Can he handle? <laughs> so I laughed and I told the guy, what makes you think I would send somebody who cannot handle? And he said, how good is he? I said, you know what? I'm not gonna say anymore. When you hear him, then you're gonna find out. And he bought the house now. I mean, I, I, I listened to that concert on YouTube. You can pull it on YouTube, it's Jeff Ahoy, Fort Collins, 2014. I mean, he's he's the one, I mean, that. That, that was my first uh, HSGA. That's the first time I went. Uh, Gerald Ross talked me into coming out. And that yeah. concert was so amazing. And I was, I just listened to it again the other day. I mean, that, that was just you know, talk, talk. Listen, part of that, yeah. uh, part of that uh, concert is going to get rebroadcast in, in uh, January for the 2021 HSGA virtual conference. Yeah. 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 At Jeff's uh, 2014. I think it's in the first block. We're still putting the schedule together, but yeah, yeah. they're gonna they're gonna re they're, at least they're gonna rod rebroadcast you know four or five tunes from it. So. Yeah, they, they gotta use that one because you know um, he, he listening to him is like you know when I, when I first heard him I said oh now I can take a vacation. <laughs> Anybody call me up for gigs? Oh, I give him Jeff's number, and, and never fails. I mean. When you hear, when you listen to Jeff play, I mean, it's like, I swear, listening, like listening to David Pili, well, man, uh, I mean, hands down, my opinion, Hawaiian steel player, you know, Hawaiian style, in the whole world, is Jeff Ahoy. And I tell you, I mean, uh, I, I, I know, I told Jeff one time, oh, man, Pete and Danny and David must be smiling down from heaven, man. You know, because he, he's like the most amazing. Well, he's been playing classical piano since four years old. So 
when you play piano, your fingers are really nimble, yeah? Because I had an electric piano that somebody gave me, you know, in the mid eighties, not knowing anything about it. So I just plug it in and check, teach myself how to play. And in one month, it was like, I thought I had arthritis because every finger would be aching. But my friend told me, no, it's just your muscles getting used to. After three months, just playing, you know, just whatever songs, I picked up the guitar and the steel guitar and it was like easier than piano, you know? And then, and then I sold the piano. <laughs> now I'm struggling again on the guitar and the steel. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, he, he's the guy. But like I said, um, you know, when I first picked up the instrument, you know, a lot of people would say, you know, why, why do you bother with a dying art? And, you know, I can see where they're coming from because when I started playing steel, it was just a handful of, of us on eight islands, Alan, Casey, Greg, myself, Juana Salazar, Eddie Palama. And I said, yeah, dying art. I said, even if one person in the whole world is playing, it's not dead yet. And look, today, there's thousands of people playing Hawaiian steel. You know, um, something that beautiful cannot fade away. Because um, the first concert with Taj I played was at the Doheny Blues Festival in California, this place called Dana Point. And I met Ben Harper. So oh, I couldn't wait to talk to the guy. So I guess he was he just got to performing and he had to leave, but he gave me some time to talk. So he said, yeah, man, I know you from YouTube. So we started talking and then he mentioned who I learned from. So I said, Pete Rogers, and he knew who Pete Rogers was. So we was taking picture and everything. And he asked me, well, how was the steel in Hawaii? And when I told him how many kids picking up, pick, are picking it up, he started tearing up. And, you know, a lot of people think, you know, steel. Well, it was to a point where I had little players, but like I said, something sound that beautiful, how, how can it fade away? It cannot. As long as you got people, as long as humans feel, it, it's always going to be around, man. How is it? Uh, how's the steel in Hawaii now? Are young people taking the steel up more? Yeah, and well, actually, thanks to Alan, you know, I mean, a lot of the kids get inspired by by uh, other players like myself and Greg, because but thanks to Alan for opening a school to where all these kids can take lessons, and then whenever we do steel guitar concerts, the kids get to see other players playing. But thanks to Alan, he, he's the one brought all the kids together. You know, because if not for still get the concerts, like in, in my time, <laughs> when I started playing, I guess the first still guitar concert that Jerry Bird put on was in 1980 or 81, the first Hawaiian steel guitar concert. But before that, if you wanted to learn steel, you would have to crash a luau or go go to a park where somebody's jamming and watch a steel player. And I and I think you know it took Alan, well like Jerry Bird too, you know, to open a school. When Jerry Bird first opened the school, um he had help from Barney Isaac. So both of them was teaching. You know, and you have to pass it on. I, I teach at my house when I can too now, you know, if uh if the kids want to learn, the, the parents come over and and the thing the thing about ch charging, <laughs> you know, if I'm if I'm in a steel festival with Alan, you know, he, he put up a workshop and that's business. So, you know, we gotta get we get Alan said, you gotta get paid. But when I teach in my house, 
I just tell the kid to pay attention. So some of the parents, they feel really bad, you know, they take out the checkbook, you gotta give you something. I said, no, you know, cause to learn all I had to do was pay attention. I never had to pay money. And I said, and if they really insist, I said, I'll tell you what then, um, I take food. <laughs> So he would come back with a pizza because some of them would, wouldn't leave. They said, we feel really bad. I said, don't feel, but we got to give you something. I said, give me a large pan pizza from Pizza Hut. <laughs> but, and you know, I don't feel right if I teach in my house and, and charging a fee. You know, I got my retirement. I'm, you know, I mean, like for Ellen, that's business for him. You know, he's open a school and that's how he makes a living. Yeah? But the way I learned was paying attention. You know, and that to, to me, that's that's the best way. Because even Jerry Bird, he would tell me he, would, he kicked out a lot of students because they would come and pay him all this money, but they wouldn't practice. So Jerry cut the line. Jerry said, what's the use? You know, you have to practice, you know. Yeah, I mean, even, even Jerry Bird was actually, Jerry Bird was the first guy I tried to copy. Although I met Pete, you know, and listening to Pete, because when it came time to buy a record, I didn't know where to go. So there was this Bears music company downtown, I don't know, they sell, you know, piano and guitars and stuff and, and record albums. And I didn't know where to go to buy a steel bar. Or, or I didn't know you had to use finger picks. So I walk in the store, you know, I'm all crazy for steel guitar already. So the first album I saw was Bird in Hawaii and he was playing the steel. So I said, oh, this must be a good one. So I bought that and I studied that album for like so many months, but like I didn't know when it sold steel bar and I didn't know you had to use finger picks. So I had a socket wrench and a guitar pick, but you know, I, had, I wanted to play. <laughs> and you know, Actually, the swell headed part came early because the first gig I played was at a veterans, veterans hall in, in Waikiki. So I had my socket wrench and had my pick and then I had already learned Aloha Oe. You know, first song I learned, you know, and I didn't know about tuning. So I had my, one of my first deal was an old beat up DR9 a Gibson. You know? I had a tuning, standard guitar tuning. But everything was like slant, so I played a long way. And I saw these two old timers clapping up. So I thought, hey, man, I must be doing something right. So they came up to me and they shook my hand. And I said, wow. And they said, the reason why you were shaking your hand is because you got guts. <laughs> you have the thing tuning to standard tuning and using a socket wrench and a guitar pick. I, I had no idea about tunings. But that's how bad I wanted to be a steel player. You know, um, just don't let nothing stop you. If you want something that bad, just start. If you, if you ain't got nothing, you know, make something. You know? Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. I think about it now and I crack up. Because when the two old timers came up and shake my hand, I was like, oh, I must be doing that. I must sound all right. <laughs> and then and now, I'm, yeah. Now, comparatively, it's so much easier. There's so much, there's almost too much information. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe you learned something uh, like a special lesson by having to just figure all that stuff on your own and, and, to, you know, just not have anything handed to you. You had to really work for it in the beginning, especially, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, like, um, I remember playing that, you know, when the two old guys told me standard tuning, I, I didn't get it, you know? So 
I'm in this housing complex playing some Hawaiian music. And this old army buddy of my dad came to me and said, hey, he playing still with us. Congratulations. What tuning is that? And I said, what do you mean, what tuning? And he picked up the steel and he went like this. He said, stupid head. <laughs> and he tuned it to C6. As soon as he put the tuning on, I started figuring out all my records at home, including the Jerry Burrell one. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I had no idea what a C6 was, you know. That's why till today, to me, it's the safest tuning. I mean, you got other tunings, the older tunings that sound so much sweeter, but it's harder to play because you have to move all over the neck. The C6 to me is the safest because everything is in that pocket, you know. Even changing chords, you can just play other strings. But the older tunings are the sweetest, like, uh, I guess, C sharp minor seven or something, E seven. You know, all this old, Doug plays a lot of these tunings on his GoPro. You know, when you play Hawaiian with the older tunings, I mean, you want to talk about sweet, but it's harder. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm lazy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just like to listen to people who, who know. And in the old HSGA concerts in the mainland, it's a lot of old time. Passed away already, but I would I would really dig when they did the old tunings like E seven and stuff because that's even before Alfred the Baca days in the fifties. You are going back to the twenties and thirties, you know that's that's what you call the the roots right there. Yeah, but to to learn those tunings, I would have to stop, you know. When you learn on one tuning, you want to learn another one. You know, Feed used to say, you have to pick one tuning and stick to that. Because if you're going to jump to another tuning, you got to start crawling. Yeah. Well, you know, all over again. He used to tell me, don't be jack of all trades. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you know, um, Nowadays, I mean, especially this year during the lockdown, you know, because with Taj, I will be doing mostly blues guitar and a few numbers on steel guitar. And I, I played with my band, the trio here, and playing, just playing, playing, and not practicing at home. And, you know, since this lockdown, I found out how really rusty I am. <laughs> That's why I, I always leave my steel guitar out right next to the recliner when I sleep. <laughs> because if I don't take it out, I, I won't go, you know. I guess I just leave it there. Some days I don't touch it, but there's some days that, you know, like between meals, I just play, play. Got, gotta, gotta maintain, man, you know. I mean, with these players coming out now, they, yeah. <laughs> you know, Kaipo might call me up one day, hey, well, man, you, know, you can retire. We found another player. <laughs> no, it, it's just for, for myself, I have to, I hate it how I started to sound. And I guess it's like what the old time is saying the older you get, the more you're going to find out that, hey, man, I hate that good. <laughs> Um, well, Bobby, I know we're, we're over an hour at this point, so I don't want to keep you too much any, oh, any but longer. You, but you, you know what? You guys want to keep on asking, don't worry. I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had one other question. I don't know if, of course, like anybody else, feel free to chime in either in the chat or just to speak up. But um, just curious if what your plans are for music. I mean, if you, I guess, no, no, we don't really know much about what's going to happen, but. Do you plan on going back on the road with Taj or? Um... Oh, yeah. yeah, because you see, what I found out is, you know, I usually tour like, I guess like nine months out of a year, you know, and since the lockdown, 
we had no 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 beef with Taj. But with, with Taj is it, they don't cancel his concert because I had no idea. Um, every concert we played at, every boat cruise, he's the headliner. So every time, you know, you would have 30 groups playing the whole day. And whenever I would go to one stage and watch these guys play, after they come off the stage, I would say, oh man, you made us nervous. I said, why? I said, because you were Taj Mahal. I said, I just joined the guy, <laughs> you know. But I had no idea he was like a big headliner. So all the concerts that supposed to be this year, instead of canceling, they push it to next year. So when I get on the road, I think I'm going to be traveling for months, you know, I mean, nonstop. And, you know, like I said, I miss all sitting here with my friends in Ohio, Japan, all over the world. But um, like I said, at least we still can keep in touch. And we, wherever in the town, then Tal said, hey, we got a whole bunch of special guest tickets. Give me the names now. <laughs> so that's one, that's one way I can keep in touch. But, you know, I really miss playing all over, you know. I mean, I, I travel with Taj and go everywhere, you know. I mean, see Caribbean, Mexico. But um, I'm always going to remember all the people I used to play with because, you know, if this lockdown get over sooner, and Taj says, like, say by February, it's all right. And Taj would call me up and say, yeah, well, we're still going to start in May. I'm going to call my old friends again. Because <laughs> when you get the chance, you know, to go, you know, because, you know, a lot of good good music, good memories. Uh, you, you cannot just uh, stop, stop everything, you know. Yeah, so... Um, plans, I don't know. Well, one thing I was telling Joe was like, uh, um, there's a lot of steel guitar purists, if you know what I mean. They don't like pedal steel. And I, I don't have nothing against them, but for me is anything that sounds sweet, it is sweet, it is good. So... I had people come up to me and say, I hope you don't play pedal steel. You know, I, I tried, you know. So I told Joe, the best way I can I can make peace with everybody is I'm going to, well, one plan, I, I plan to do a steel solo album and it's cheaper now because you got, you know, home recordings. And I'm going to have Jeff play background pedal steel while I play lap steel. I mean, <clears throat> there's room enough in the world for all kind of steel. I mean, if if somebody don't like pedal steel, well, that's 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 them, you know. But to me, you know, even when you listen old country music when they had non-pedals, they good stuff. And when you listen to a pedal steel player who knows when to stop, when to step the pedal. It's the sweetest sound around, too. And yeah, the thing is, people just got to relax. <laughs> you know, you know go, go eat something or cook something and you can relax easier. <laughs> because, you know, a lot of the HSGA festivals in the mainland, you know, we heard pedal steel players and, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. Just that, like I said, there's you know, well, you heard Alan, you play pedal steel? <laughs> Nothing wrong. Nothing wrong with that, man. I mean, Robert Randolph, he plays a pedal steel like Jimi Hendrix. You know, it's all right, too. It's a whatever you want to play, you know. If somebody tell you, like, like Feed used to say, or the old Hawaiians used to tell me, if somebody come up to you and said, why are you going to play that stuff? All Hawaiians would say, you don't like it. Beat it. Don't listen. <laughs> Plug up your ears. I'm not going to stop. 
You know, you just you just gotta play what's what's inside of you. If you wanna mix, you wanna mix it up, mix them up. You know, you cannot please the whole world. I mean, somebody out there is gonna like what you're doing. Yep. <laughs> hey, anything you guys wanna ask, just ask me. Oh, and one one other thing. Um, I I only found out about Indonesian steel players when I went to the, the um, HSG festival in in '95. You know, in Joliet, Chicago. That's why I met Doug and Barb, and a lot of the old timers turned on turned me on to old recordings. And when I first heard the Indonesian players, I really dig their style because they have a certain vibrato that no other culture has. I mean, there's a lot of uh, players um, all over the world, you know, and to me, you know, a lot of people say, I, I have some friends who say, Oh, you know, you have to be Hawaiian or you, oh, you know, to play this. You know what? Everybody's, the same. Everybody's human and that's all you have to be. You know, because man, when I listen to like Rudy, Wairata and all this, the older steel players from Europe, um, I mean, man, there's a lot of good players. And you know, you don't have to be Hawaiian. Like one guy he came up to me in the 80s, he shook my hand and all wrong. I said, hey, you, you're pretty good. Too bad you're not Hawaiian. <laughs> so I looked at him, I said, are you Hawaiian? He said, oh yeah, and I'm proud of it. I said, you play steel? He just walked away. <laughs> you know, I mean, doesn't matter where you come from in the world. I know I got students in Japan who's, who's learning so fast and really sounding one of them even fooled me I, I, you know I could swear that was a Hawaiian player you know I heard this CD if you're a Japanese guy speaks a little bit English but when you play so all you gotta be is human you know I'm pretty sure out there there's a spaceman who can play just as good as I, <laughs> I can you know, it's it's a it's a universal thing, man. Feel, it comes right down to feel. You know, like when I first went to um, Colorado, and I seen Crystal play, and all these other guys who play this old and some gypsy stuff. And I got floored, man. I mean, it all all music belongs. Put it that way. Well, but you can leave out the slam dancing. <laughs> but, you know, there's good music all over the world. And I learned that when I started to travel. And I remember when I came back from my first trip, it, it was Joliet when I met Doug and Barb. You know, when I came back, all my friends couldn't wait. At a party, they said, so. I bet you kicked ass. I said, no, man, I got minds kicked by old timers. You know, you, you don't really know how much good music is out. I, I never really knew until I started to travel. And the more I travel, the more I'm finding out music from all cultures. And, and it's really heavy, man, that feeling. You know, you, you cannot let that feeling die inside of you. Yeah. Well, Bobby, that's Especially a... when um, Joe and Edwin and Chris played the gypsy stuff. You know, I, I, I jumped on stage with ukulele thinking, oh, I'm going to jam with them. I started jamming up. <laughs> hey, music excites you, man. You want to be on stage? Bobby, that was really fun. I, it was an honor for you to have you on stage. I oh. was really Fun. It was fun, yeah. yeah. I mean, 
and and the, you guys knocked the crowd out because <laughs> that's the first time the crowd came to Tulsi Steel and they heard Gypsy Jazz. I yeah. was I was so I was so happy to have Joe there. Yeah, you know, like like that 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 festival was so fun because we got to to jam at night and uh, you know it was just like really a super great weekend. But yeah, it was really really yeah. fun fun set. There he is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, so like, like you, you know, you got all these music festivals. To me, <laughs> I mean, they should make a music festival like, like um, like the ones that Doug Doug took me to. Doug Smith took me to the Ohio City Folk Fest, where you got three days in a small town with all these stages with music from every corner of the world. I mean, man, and that's, that's like, it's like you're traveling all over, listening to all these different cultures. And you can learn so much, man. so much more, you know. To me, you never stop learning. Once you think you learn everything, then you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, you're in trouble, you know. A lot of old timers was telling me, you know, you know when you're gonna stop learning. They don't ask me when I was young. So I said, oh yeah, I want to get the answer. I said, when? You see, when you reach the pearly gates. <laughs> so yeah, never stop. You know, like when I first saw um, Doug with his rope tricks, you know, in Hawaii. You know. The closest we got to, to being like cowboys was every time um, Roy Rogers would come on, we would get our cowboy hat and a pop gun, and my mom would um, fry up some hot dogs and we put in on fork and make believe we're sitting around a campfire. That's the closest thing we got. You know, when I first, and we all was in, we, had all, we all had our lunch can with, with the guys swinging the rope, and we ne I never saw Rope tricks until I met Doug, and I'm watching him and I'm saying, "We went, we went to Elkins and Davis College in West Virginia, and Doug stole the show. People was going crazy, and then I was thinking, man, I wonder if I could learn that. So I tried a little while, and then I was thinking, you're fooling yourself, probably. You're probably gonna hang yourself by the neck. <laughs> so leave it to the professional." <laughs> Well, like I said, there's one way, one way to just like virtual travel all over the world, just listen to the music. You listen to the music, then you're gonna find out that we're all the same. You know, we, if you don't listen to music, and of course the food goes along with that too. You know, the first time we went to the Ohio City Folk Fest, Doug told me, you should try this frozen lemonade. So I love lemonade. So when I first tasted it, I was eating that thing all day. I kept on standing in line, not even thinking, just going, man, it's the best thing I've ever tasted. That night, I had the meanest stomach ache <laughs> in all my life. You know, you learn, yeah, but um, a festival should be three days of all types of music. I mean, that's the only way Everybody can listen this other, like, you, know, you know, everybody can learn each other's music. Because a lot of people never heard of Hawaiian steel or, you know, I mean, I never, I had no idea people were still playing gypsy jazz until I met Joe I mean, I was like, Phew. you know, I wonder if I should learn that. And my conscience will say, no, no, just stick to you still. <laughs> you can listen to him. <laughs> yeah, but when you come right on to it, yeah, there's, there's a lot of technical stuff in music things, but the main thing is if you don't have feel, you better still don't play the music. You, you have to have to be in your soul. 
you know. That's why I, I, I did go into all these concerts all over the world, meet, meeting other cultures and, um, yeah, just learning from each other, you know. To me, only music can bring people together. Yeah, it always does, man. But of course, there's the food. <laughs> always going to food go with music, man. Like a, a big luau with with old, old Hawaiian music or what, what have you, you know. So we owe you a pizza, Bobby. <laughs> and Chris, what what's that? What's that pizza place right across that hotel in Fort Collins? It's right across the street. Yeah, in the strip mall, right? Yeah. Oh, oh they got good Italian food and the yeah. sushi, sushi place, a couple of <laughs> blocks. From. You know, usually I go to festivals and lose weight. Man, I started gaining weight at Fort Collins. <laughs> right. That's yeah, totally I, true. Used, I used to go to the Italian place with Paul Honeycutt. Before yeah. he passed away. Good, good. Yeah. yeah, I don't remember. It's right across the street. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know what you're talking about, but I don't know the name anymore. But yeah, so much good stuff. Yeah. Hey, Joseph. I was wondering, could you? Someone is asking if you have um, a PayPal account. You could also share, just in case folks who don't use Venmo might be able to. Yeah. Share something. Yeah, and you know, mainly when I would go to steel festivals in the mainland or Midwest, number one um, people who used to take care of me is Doug Smith and Barb Coons. And, and hanging with them was, um, I, I got blown away by my whole country music. And then they do that square dancing. You know, man, that's some powerful music. <laughs> you know, I never I never heard that in my life. Yeah, and they, they start playing and I'm like stunned, man. You know, so that that, that that's that's one of my first things I had of um, you know, my, my, my sister would um, people in Hawaii would listen to like um, um contemporary country. I found out country and music was until I started hanging in the Midwest. I mean, it means so much better. Real. Right coming right from the that's that's where I started is playing uh playing uh square dance music on a fiddle. Uh, oh yeah. man I tell you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's there's so much good music out there to to listen to to um to to learn you know I mean I'm always amazed at the music I listen when I when traveling even when we play with Taj you know you know we do our set and then I see people from Louisiana playing all this real music you know some of the music so deep. It, it can bring tears to your eyes. And when that happened, I mean, that's it. You know, uh, and that's, the guys would come off the stage. And funny how all the bands on the boat crews got this start with Taj Mahal helping them because he's a real helping guy. Yeah? And I would, when I would tell them I did their music, you know, they was like, oh, thank you, thank you. You know, I mean, like I said, he just enjoy the whole world of music because everything out there, if it touches your heart, this is all good, man. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that may be a good place to, to wrap up. Um, unless anybody's got some questions, but Bobby, thank you so much for you know what? your time. And I, I, like I told you, a lot of people tell me I should write a book. You know what? This is so much better of an idea. <laughs> yeah, because right everything I'm saying, you're you're hearing it, you know. And I I know friends who would get interviewed and then when they read the book, yeah, I didn't say that. You know what I mean? This 
This is going to be one of the best. I got to thank Joe. No, really, bro. Hey, Joe, thanks a lot, uh, man, for I really, setting it all up. Yeah. I really enjoyed this. Maybe next one. Yeah. I'm going to have my steel, steel with me and I can play some, play some and talk some. Oh, that'd be wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah. Um, well, everybody, I'll, I'll hopefully you sell the, the link in um, for PayPal in the in the chat, and I'll post it on the Facebook group too. Um, and Bobby, thanks again, and I hope you stay safe, and hope we get to see you out on the road soon. Oh yeah, and thank all you guys, man, and thanks everybody. Call yeah. <laughs> Happy birthday, Bobby. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, you know that you know that morning. I look at all my comments. It's just this thing. You got a lot of comments. Man. So it was like, I spent the first six hours reading all the I'm thinking, okay, it's finished. <laughs> oh, could I look more. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, um, I, I really, I'm really happy meeting and crossing paths with all of you, man, because um, I learned I learn a lot of things from talking with everybody and listening to everybody's music. I mean, like like they said, lessons is right in front of you. If you don't, if you don't observe, you, you won't see it, man. And you'll be digging in your pocket. Somebody teach me something. You know? ah, just It's right in front of your eyes. Life, music, all kind of lessons. So, hey, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Bobby. <laughs> Thank you, Bobby. And then, who knows, maybe next time, if Doug is here, I can be playing and he can be doing some rope tricks. <laughs> Good idea. Thanks for tuning in, man. All right, Bobby, Thank you. guys. Okay, Take care, everybody. Uh, and stay safe, yeah? Thank you.